and welcome to episode 125 of Real Life Ghost Stories. How you do? To kick things off this week, we need to thank our newest Patreon subscribers. We would like to thank Taylor Harding, Talia Melissa, Laura Neal, Danny O'Brien, Sarah Kelly, Gail Mugford, Melissa Dixon, David Adkins, Shelby, Michelle Lincoln, Julianne Lee, Annette Baba, Donald Crystal, Ruth Newcomb, Roshni, Iris Art Studios, Cameron Stubbins, Hannah Ord, Jordi Payech, Mazio. Thank you so much for being our Patreon subscribers. We love you. We appreciate you every damn day. And our film review this week. Our film review is Wakewood. Wakewood was released in 2009. It has 5.5 out of 10 on IMDb and 80% on Rotten Tomatoes. Would you like a synopsis? Yes, please. After a crazed dog kills their nine-year-old daughter, Patrick and his wife Louise decide to relocate. Moving to the remote town on Wakewood, they stumble upon the locals enacting a terrifying ritual said to bring the dead back to life for three days. Desperate to see their daughter alive again, the couple strike a deal with the town leader, Arthur, to be a part of the ceremony. But how will they cope when the three days are up? So what were your thoughts on this film? I didn't love it, but I kind of liked it. I feel like it was a good attempt at something. Let down a little bit by the acting and mainly by the level of gore. I felt like the gore was just overdone. Not unnecessary, just overdone. I didn't realise that Hammer were still making horror films. I know that's probably really naive of me. As you guys know, I'm not into horror that is like really, really gory, like slasher films. It's not my thing. And dear God, this film is gory. It is Hammer horror gore that's tried to kind of weave itself into like a psychological horror and it really doesn't work. It was definitely one of the things that sort of turned me off it a little bit. I don't think it was like, so we're not talking like sore levels of gore. It's just when it was gory, it was kind of not needed. And you get that impression fairly early on because the main character, Patrick, is a vet. And uh, he's obviously delivering a cow. And you basically see him do a C-section on a cow, which I which has a reason. It mirrors something that happens later in the movie. But man, I didn't need to see it. No, I, d- I don't think it really did have a reason. Like, I think it could have... You could have perfectly well told the story without s- showing him delivering a a calf via C-section in great detail. There's also like a lot of unnecessary blood, like Hammer Horror are clearly obsessed with people bleeding from their eyes, (laughs) even when their death would suggest that bleeding from their eyes is improbable to be to be really frank (laughs) yeah there's also there's also a bit later on where there's a dead body that inexplicably bleeds a lot of blood and it's been dead for ages like at least a day and a half and you're just like okay i see where you're coming from and that was the that was the main thing that ruined it for me for this i like the story i thought it was kind of like a little take on pet cemetery but for humans and like i I thought actually it was quite good and they did and i they did a way of making the sort of big bad quite quite scary in a way but yeah it was too too focused on on blood and it, like there there's a lot about grief in this film i think that could have been explored more the the death of the little girl in the beginning is brutal and savage so i think major trigger warning for that she gets savaged by a dog and while you don't like fully see it, it because it's hammer they do they do enough for it to be gratuitously gory um and there were bits of it that I genuinely did struggle to watch and I had to look away for just because it was so gory. But I think as as a as an idea, as a concept, it does leave you walk away thinking, if I had the chance to bring somebody back for three days, would I do it? And how would I feel about it? And it's an interesting concept. And you, you have all these ritualistic elements to it where all of the local people are in on this situation, like they all know it's happening. When somebody in the community dies, they then have the opportunity to bring somebody else back. And I don't think the ritualistic part of it was very well thought out because the ritual was a bit, I thought it was just a bit silly, to be to be perfectly frank, and incredibly gory because it was Hammer. Like, and I keep saying the phrase because it was Hammer, how many times can I say it in one film review? But like, it was interesting, just maybe needed more budget for it to be well done and less gore. 
Yeah, I think that's probably, it was a bit of a catch, I'd imagine it's probably a bit of a catch-22 because if you get a, a studio like Hammer's name, it probably does you lots of favours in terms of distribution and stuff like that, but you also have to probably bend a little bit to their direction. Now, that's I don't know anything about the creation of this film, so that might not be true, but I'd imagine there is an element of that to it. The best thing about the ritualistic thing for me that just made me laugh is is the use of an of an abacus to somehow turn to the spirit. Now, I don't know whether this may be some kind of um like witch equipment. I don't know that I haven't seen before, which is fair enough if it is. But it just looked like an abacus to me. And Timothy Spall's character putting in all that information into it, it was just <laughs> with an abacus. It's like when children are playing with it and they're using it as a you know, like a computer or something, and they're pretending it's doing other things. It was a little bit like that, and that did amuse me highly. But I, I quite liked it overall. Also, Aidan Gillen seems to be in every Irish horror film pre-Game of Thrones. Aidan Gillen is Littlefinger, isn't he, in Game of Thrones? Yeah, I think so. I didn't watch all of Game of Thrones. I got to a point, and then, as I do with most things in life, I got bored. Yeah, Aidan Gillen must have been the choice for... Irish horror films of a certain period because we keep we just keep seeing him in horror films. Um, I don't know what what would you give this film out of five? I think I gave it. Oh, before we go any further, the little girl in it is freaky as. Yeah, she's and very good. I thought she was very competent for a girl of her age. Oh my god, she's only little. Yeah. They obviously they clearly bring her back from the dead. Oh, she's freaky as shit. Yeah. Without going overboard, like there's no kind of um horror movie esque. I'm a creepy child. She's just weird and it's really, it's really unnerving and really disturbing. And we had a very long conversation about how they managed to get a child actress to do the horrible, gory things that she does. Because, dear Lord, she is, she is scary. Yeah, I thought she was really good. I thought she was quite a strong actor. And though she has some lines that are actually quite, like, chucklesome in that she's sort of like, you know, when kids are naughty and you laugh at them when you're not supposed to. It's it's lines like that where you're just like... (laughs) Which I kind of appreciated. So, sorry for interrupting. What would you now give it out of five? Um, I think I gave it a three. I've done that thing again where I've rated it and then completely forgotten what I rated. So, it's a three. If you're wondering what Dan means by that, so he uses a thing, an app, is it? Yeah. Called Letterbox, where every time he watches a film, he rates it. And then he got really annoyed because he was rating things on Letterbox and then giving them an entirely different rating on the film review. So if you, yeah, he, he has a Letterbox basically, which is where he rates all his films. I am going to give it a three as well. I thought it was a genuinely really good concept. Like I thought it was interesting. If you're a fan of Pet Cemetery, definitely give it a watch. I think if you're not a fan of gore, stay, stay away from it because it is very gratuitous at times. But there is a great cow related death that i wasn't expecting so remember we had that film with the death by corn on the cob this is up there with corn on the cob death and the cow is huge it's the biggest damn cow i've ever seen in my life (laughs) which brings us to our story this week which is not about bringing people back from the dead even though it is easter it's the theme of the moment i think people rising from the dead Um, Not this episode. But it is a story that most people listening will be in some way familiar with. Now, I want to give a massive shout out to Kristen from Guide to the Unknown podcast. I really wanted to get her on this episode because she has a lot of bizarre knowledge about this topic. But I just couldn't get my timings right. So you will hear on a future episode. But uh, yes, she was the she was the one that suggested elements of this story and being very kg and i'm not going to give anything away because i want to crack straight on with this one are you ready for a story that is going to change your perception of life no let's do this it was january 1909 and all the towns were quiet it was almost as if the world had held its breath and was waiting for something to happen something bad. The schools were shut. The shops shuttered early every day and no one dared to leave their houses after the sun set for fear that they would be taken. In the vast wild woodlands that surrounded the townlands there had been whispers of a creature that lurked in the trees. The creature was both inhuman and otherworldly The people who lived in the woods were not taken seriously by the townsfolk, though. 
They had chosen a life of isolation in the wilderness. For a variety of reasons. Some just wanted to live away from the confines of society. Others were moonshining, concocting the highly illegal liquor that could either get you drunk or make you go blind. And many were running from something. The law or sometimes their past. So the people in the townlands looked down upon them. And when the stories of the creature in the woods reached the doorsteps of the houses, the people scoffed and thought they were the ravings of feral people whose brains were addled by too much moonshine and solitude. But that all changed when newspaper reports began to emerge of strange winged beasts that haunted the area. And one such report scared people more than the others. The Navy had come to town, uniformed and weapons ready. They were heading to the woodlands to train and run drills. The vast expanse of trees meant that they could train in relative safety and even fire heavy weaponry. It wasn't what you would call a routine drill. Commander Stephen Decatur was overseeing a training session in which Navy officers were loading and firing cannons at various targets. The terrain posed brilliant challenges for the trainees. The bright sunshine dappled through the trees' varying visibility. The sounds of the forest shrieked, chirped and rustled around them, providing endless distractions, and the monotony of the tree line tested their depth perception. It was Commander Decatur who first noticed that something was wrong. At first, it was merely a feeling but he couldn't quite put his finger on it. The trainees were diligently doing what they had been shown. No one was doing anything inadvertently dangerous. There was no change in weather or atmosphere that he could feel. His eyes scanned the area and he could see nothing out of place. And then it hit him. Beneath the rattling of cannons and the instructions of his trainees, there was nothing. A deep, Heavy silence had fallen upon the woods. The cheeps and whistles and rustles and snuffles had all stopped. And all that remained was a silence that seemed to be waiting. He knew it was the type of silence that came when a large predator was prowling. And he was the first to see it. He didn't utter a word, but watched it as his brain whirred into action, mapping out strategies. But it is next to impossible to strategize when you don't actually know what it is you are looking at. He seemed to be watching a creature emerging from the tree line. It was walking on two cloven feet and stood upright. It had a head that resembled that of a horse or a goat. It had a long, clearly forked tail Its arms were small and ended with three long claws and upon its shoulders sat two huge leathery wings. The commander was rattled and needed to compose himself before he ordered his men to do anything. But he didn't act quickly enough. A cry erupted from one of the men which rippled through them all and then suddenly trigger happy and shocked a cannon blasted in the direction of the creature. There was a blood-curdling scream and a sickening thud as the cannonball made contact and the creature crumpled into a heap. A silence descended on the men as they watched the spot where the impact had happened. The leathery wings rose into the air and flapped and the creature ascended and flew off above the tree line with an inhuman cry. It was one thing when the people of the woods told stories of the creature, but when the Navy officers came with stories of something winged and supernatural that couldn't be killed with cannon fire, the people in the townlands of the Pine Barrens grew nervous. There had always been tales of mysterious creatures that crossed the countryside, but suddenly the threat felt very real. Older people in the community told stories of footprints in the snow that were made by a two-footed creature with cloven hooves. 
the footprints would seemingly pass straight over buildings without missing a stride, leading people to believe that whatever this was had wings. People recalled times that animals had been savaged on their lands with no explanation and sniffer dogs that simply refused to follow the scent of this creature. In total, there were 1,000 sightings of the Jersey Devil reported in that time period. Police forces in Camden, Bristol and Pennsylvania were said to have fired on the beast at various points but to no effect. Groups of men roamed the Pine Barrens with their guns locked and loaded hunting the Jersey Devil. The Philadelphia Zoo offered a $10,000 reward to anyone who could capture the beast and so intense was the fear that the schools surrounding the Pine Barrens closed in case the devil would come and pluck children to their doom. Eventually the fear abated, and people returned to their normal lives. But the sightings of the Jersey Devil have continued for years. But where did it all start? To get to the bottom of it, we need to go all the way back to the 1700s. Mother Leeds lived in the Pine Barrens, and her family grew and grew. She was incredibly poor and her growing family exacerbated this. With 12 hungry children to feed already, she was devastated to find out that she was pregnant with her 13th baby, and in frustration and anger, she cursed the child that was growing in her womb. How would she and her other children survive with another mouth to feed? With no other option, Mother Leeds continued with her pregnancy. And when the night came for her to give birth, a violent storm raged. The winds howled and the house shook as Mother Leeds, assisted by her friends, screamed in pain as the baby was born. It was a perfectly healthy baby boy. Until it wasn't. It began to transform before their eyes into something monstrous. Its legs morphed into hooves and a forked tail appeared. Leathery wings sprouted from its shoulders and it shrieked and wailed and eventually escaped its mother's grip and shot up the chimney. When local ministers were informed of this ungodly event, they decided to perform an exorcism on the general area, but to no avail, as the Jersey Devil continues to be sighted to this day. You'll probably be surprised to know that there are elements of this story that are actually true. But it becomes a bit muddled with politics, astrology and Benjamin Franklin. The Leeds family name was a prominent family name in the area. And there was indeed a woman named Deborah Leeds who had at least 12 children with her husband Japhet. This is based on his will that was written in 1736. However... The real Leeds family connection to the Jersey Devil seems to be a bit more complicated and more so to do with political slander rather than anything supernatural. Daniel Leeds wrote almanacs, which are like calendars that contain statistical data and astrological events. Unfortunately, his use of astrology caused a rift between Leeds and the Quaker community as the Quaker community saw astrology as being a pagan ritual that was definitely blasphemous. Leeds doubled down, and his esoteric writing coupled with his loyalty to British rule saw him becoming more and more ostracised, and eventually he earned the reputation of being a, quote, evil man. Daniel Leeds passed his almanac business to his son Titan, who became enveloped in a bitter almanac-based rivalry with the young upstart Benjamin Franklin. Yes, that Benjamin Franklin. As a joke, Franklin predicted the death of Titan in one of his almanacs. But Titan was not amused. For Franklin, it was a dig at Titan's use of astrology and a way to sell more almanacs. But Titan responded by calling Franklin a fool and a liar. Franklin then responded by insisting that his prediction had come true and that Titan was, quote, thus writing his almanacs as a ghost. Many historians believe that the birth of what we now know as the Jersey Devil was a mixture of local legend, 
the widespread dislike of the Leeds family, Daniel Leeds being accused of partaking in pagan ritualistic practices, Franklin's insistence that Titan Leeds was in fact communicating from beyond the grave, and finally the often overlooked fact of the Leeds family crest. The Leeds family crest, which was printed on each almanac, was a wyvern, which is a bat-winged creature of legend that bears a striking resemblance to what is reported in sightings of the Jersey Devil. So there's two ways to look at it really. Either the legend existed and was just pinned to the Leeds family because people didn't like them, or the legend was born purely of people's dislike of the Leeds family, and in part because of Benjamin Franklin calling Daniel Leeds a monster and his son Titan a ghost. The only problem with this is that it doesn't explain the continued sightings of the Jersey Devil that continue to this day. In colonial times, it seems that the Jersey Devil was a trickster who was responsible for any bad luck in the community. If your well went dry, it was the work of the Jersey Devil. If your crops failed, you'd been cursed by the Jersey Devil. And while the Jersey Devil has become a legend that is known worldwide, there are still countless people who claim to have seen it and heard it to this day. The stories that I'm about to tell you are adapted from real submissions to the website weirdnewjersey.com. It was the late 1980s, and Frank was headed deep into the Pine Barrens with his friends for a camping trip, and the last thing on his mind was the Jersey Devil. They were all on their motorbikes, and rode into the wilderness to find the perfect spot to set up camp. Their night passed without incident, and they drank and swapped stories deep into the darkness. In the early hours of the morning, Frank and three of his friends decided to hit the trail to get a glimpse of the vast woodland in the early morning sunlight. They rode off, leaving their friends sleeping off their hangovers. As they rode, the wind whipped past their faces, the air rich with the scent of pine that was heavy in the air. Frank signalled to his friends to ride off the trail, and he turned into the trees. Within a hundred yards, his bike had stalled. He assumed it was the terrain, but he realised that his friends' bikes had stalled also. Just as he tried to kickstart his bike back into life, the screaming started. It was all around them and seemed impossibly loud, like something being tortured. It was a sound that they had never heard before and have never heard since. They kick-started their bikes and rode back to their camp as quickly as they could. When they arrived back still shaken, their friends asked them, Did you guys hear that strange screaming in the woods? The camp was four miles away from where they had been. They decided that it must have been an animal, a fox or a bobcat warning them out of its territory, until they went to a bar in the nearest town that night. They had run out of drink and headed in search of some much-needed refreshments. Frank, still shook from what had happened to him earlier, didn't notice the barman trying to get his attention. Eventually... Frank zoned back in to the barman asking him, Hey, kid, are you okay? Have you seen a ghost or something? And laughing. Frank laughed along weakly and told him about the fright they had gotten in the woods and apologised to the barman saying that it just shook him up a bit. The barman laughed again and told him he was right to be shook and that it sounded like he had met his friend. Frank was puzzled and frowned at the barman, who motioned at him to follow him out back. Frank followed, and there, outside, was a trash can. It had been completely shredded by something that had three claws. See? the barman said. You met my friend. When it came to canoeing, Katie was pretty confident in her skills and abilities. Every year she would travel to the Pine Barrens and canoe down the river through the pine trees. And every year she would hear something stalking her canoe from within the tree line. She would hear the branches snap under its feet 
and she knew from experience that it was bipedal. She could only ever hear two footsteps. Occasionally she would hear whatever it was grunt and snort, but having no option she would just continue down the river. Each year was the same, until one year it frightened her so much that she refused to return to the woods. This year she was canoeing, with a friend, and moving down the river at a relatively easy pace. They spotted something bright in the distance on the bank of the river, and as they got closer, they realised it was a bag, or rather what was left of a bag. They stopped to see if there were any identifying items in the bag, when they realised that it was surrounded by prints. The prints looked like horses' hooves, only much bigger. They looked at each other, and Katie could only think of the previous trips and the growls and grunts she would hear from the tree line as something stalked her canoe. And then the screaming started. The screaming would haunt Katie's dreams for years to come. It was loud, almost human but definitely not, and full of anger and hate. The girls paddled off as quickly as they could, but they could hear the creature following their canoe, keeping just out of sight, growling and snorting from the trees. Every time the girls slowed or paused, the thing came closer to the river until finally, in a sudden and unexpected jolt they capsized the vessel. They frantically tried to right themselves, hearing the pounding of hooves coming closer and closer. They righted themselves, not daring to turn around and look at what was chasing them, and paddled frantically down the river. They made it back to base, packed up their belongings and left. But as they drove, Katie leaned her head against the window and looked into the forest, where she saw a tiny, old, wooden, run-down cottage. And standing outside that cottage was an old woman. One side of her face was torn and bleeding. She looked right back at Katie, and then vanished. Okay, so before we go any further and before you give your opinion and your thoughts on this I just want to make it very clear that yes I did take some poetic license with this story. The reason is that because it's so folkloric at this stage there are about a million and one different versions and in some versions the navy it happened a bazillion years ago and in other versions it happened just before the big event in 1909. In most versions, the commander is inspecting cannonballs. In some versions, he's running a training exercise. So I went with the training exercise because it just kind of worked with the theme. So if my version of the story that I've told you is different to the story that you know, please don't hate me. It's just because I went with one singular story that just worked for this episode. I also have some theories, but you go first. It's funny that you should say that about that story because I have personally never heard any version of that story before. The only thing that I can remember from my previous experience of the Jersey Devil, which makes me sound like I've seen it, um, is the story about Mrs. Leeds having a demon baby. I I can't remember ever being told about the Navy exercises before. So, And even that story is disputed, the story about uh, Mrs. Leeds or Mother Leeds being the original story because in other versions the original story is a young girl has sex outside of wedlock with a British soldier and then ends up giving birth to this demon baby which says a lot about kind of the attitude to British soldiers at the time I think more so than anything else but there are varying versions of the origin story but the mother leads one is just the most popular it's also the true one I've seen the birth certificate that says (laughs) demon baby on it (laughs) imagine just (laughs) fuck Demon baby. That's it. That's all the birth certificate says. And a sad face. <laughs> You've seen it too. Yeah, I did. Oh. I did. I saw it in my travels <laughs> in my research for this episode. So in order to structure this conversation a little bit, I have some theories for you. I think I have, uh, I have five theories altogether. Ooh. So theory number one. The story of the Jersey Devil was a tall tale created by settlers who were unaccustomed to a terrain like this and created stories of a devil to explain misdeeds. 
I think that's one of the things that if we were to do a pros and cons list of living at this time, it would be mainly cons, but one of the pros would be that you could make crap like this up to cover up the fact that you've done something naughty. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be taken into consideration. Because <laughs> I feel like nowadays, if you blame it on the devil in the woods, I don't think that's holding up. But it, it reminds me of, a, you know, the I don't know if you've seen it, but the Treehouse of Horror Simpsons with the witches where they're like she's a witch and anybody who annoys you in the community you just go she's a witch <laughs> and everybody gets their torch and pitchforks it's that kind of idea isn't it except i mean mine was far more sinister because i'm just saying if i didn't like people in the community i'd blame them for <laughs> witchcraft which i think happened pretty regularly but like yeah i get it you know your crops fail you're like oh, i'm not a shit farmer it was the jersey devil they didn't call it that at the time but you know it was the jersey devil that's all you need to say brilliant you never, ever have to take responsibility for anything, ever. I have a feeling that there's probably an element of something to this theory. I am not throwing my lot in on this theory because I think it's too straightforward. But I think, you know, if you want to talk about telling stories to ward people off the forest or having a scapegoat, it kind of fits in quite nicely. And it, all it takes is one well-constructed story of scapegoatism that it becomes a reference point for other people that need it. <laughs> okay, so we're not going with that theory for now. No, at all. Okay. <laughs> so that, right, we, we've immediately <laughs> disposed of that theory. Theory number two. The story of the Jersey Devil was created by the Pineys. Now, that is a word that I came across in my research. I'm not sure if it's still used and it might be a word that's offensive. So I'm not trying to be ignorant, but that was the word they were called at the time. And those that was the name for the people who chose to live in the Pine Barrens, like live out in the wilderness on their own. In modern day terms, what we would see on English television, they would be referred to as like rednecks. Right, That's the, the term that would be used. But really, they were just people who had chosen to live in the Pine Barrens. And it could be for a variety of reasons. Some of them, some of it was criminality. Some of it was just because they wanted to. Some of it was brown moonshine, which I'm down, you know, go for it. You do you, kiddo. But there is a belief that these people created the story of the Jersey Devil to keep people away. Because they were like, you are in my space. I have decided to go live in the woods on my own. Stop coming up here on your little hikes. There's a monster that's going to eat you. Again, I feel like there's credence to this. If I've learned anything from watching Mountain Men, your land is per- always being purposely encroached upon. So if you live out in the sticks and you're trying to, you know, keep a, a life of solitude and, and you're probably, you know, living off the land and, and being very wholesome, you don't want people up there. And actually, in this day and age, as I already said after the first theory, it doesn't take a lot to keep people away. <laughs> and actually, you know, there's, there's something to, there is something to that about a well-constructed story to keep people off your land, just in the same way that it would be a well-constructed story to keep your kids out of the forest. And I think that how much crack would it be? Like, it would be such good fun frightening people with the story. If you're living in the wilderness and you know that you do some really loud screams and everyone freaks out, oh, that'd be right crack though, wouldn't it? You just have to see how much you could get away with. Like push it as far. I'd be out there making really camp horse costumes with wings and all, having a great time. That's what I'd be doing, living in the wilderness with my witchy bits, having a nice time, scaring people, scaring the normies. That'd be me. I feel like I would be too scared of what goes around might come back round, so I'd be too scared to scare people because I'd I feel like I'd be the plot of a horror movie where I'd start off by scaring people, and then a real thing would come and kill me. Theory number three. The story was solely created in a political and religious almanac fueled <laughs> war <laughs> to push the narrative that pro-British ideals were wrong. This is the original Twitter war, right? I just think this is the funniest thing. It's like, you know, when YouTubers create beef and I'm saying beef in inverted commas to get more views. Franklin did this to sell more almanacs. And it's I'm not going to lie. It's pretty funny. Like it was a pretty funny joke. He's full on trolling Titan. Yeah. Like full on. Like he's just like he knows that people aren't going to believe that he's dead. But the most person that he was trying to get to is the one that's most wound up about it. And I think it is brilliant. I don't think this has got any credence for creating the story though. Do you not? So you don't think 
the the story came from people's hatred of the Leeds family that was fueled by, in some way, by Benjamin Frank. I mean, he didn't set out to be like, I know it's going to ruin these people. Linking them to a mythical being. No, I, I, I presume he just wanted to sell almanacs, as was his want at the time. Um, and I never did think that I would be discussing almanac wars in a story. But here we are. These things happen. I feel like it's got a relation to the story because of the Leeds family name. I feel like the story itself predates the Almanac Wars. Okay, interesting. I actually think so too. I think because of the Almanac Wars, um, the story probably became more synonymous with the Leeds family, but existed beforehand. And maybe because there was, you know, there was people that lived in the Pine Barrens that did have 12, 13 children. There was a real person that was somehow connected to the story, but who knows? Um, but it probably was was perpetuated by Benjamin Franklin just trying to trying to sell some shit, trying to flog some almanacs. And I'm here for it. I think it's hilarious. The one part of this theory that does bear a little bit of credence to me is that maybe if the family was very into astrology, then that may explain where it comes from. So I feel like it's more likely to be an attack on astrology than it is to be based on almanacs. Yeah, it was it, the astrology was the big issue for the Quakers because they said, no, astrology is a pagan ritual. And as a result of that, the the rumour in the community grew that uh, Daniel Leeds was like into dark magic and stuff. And it all started just because he was writing almanacs, which are famously, you know, full of weird predictions for the year. So they just didn't like it because they thought it goes against Christian values. It's also the cause of the rise of Biff Tannen as well. I don't know what that means. Some people will, don't worry. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, we're going to move on swiftly. Theory number four newspaper wars so this is a really interesting one and i hadn't considered it i don't remember what website i read it on but all the research links are in the description of this video but at the time a newspaper ran with a story about the jersey devil and at the time newspaper wars were a very big thing so kind of like in my head i saw the guy in spider-man who works for the daily bugle who's like, Spider-Man, villain, hero, write it down, print it, who cares? That kind of thing. So there is a there is a very strong theory that most of the stories actually weren't true. And because one paper sold out with a story of the Jersey Devil, the other newspapers in the area were like, shit, we need a story about the Jersey Devil. Somebody find one, can't find one, make it up, it's fine. And a lot of the stories, the like legendary stories come from these newspaper wars. So there is a possibility that they weren't actually true. However... The kids not going to school, like everybody freaking out. That was all true. Yeah, there's there's something there's probably something to that as well. Again, I'm not going with it. I'm, all my eggs are in, in one basket and this isn't it. But there's probably an element of truth to that as well, actually, because it would only take one story being successful for the rest to want to follow suit and then it becomes a phenomena which people react to. Because actually it would only take one school leaving themselves open and then something happening to a child that was perfectly natural for it <laughs> there to be absolute uproar. And in a time where there wasn't instantaneous uh, filtering of news, imagine how that story would change by the time it got to other communities. You'd have a kid who fell on the way to school and grazed his knee. And by the time it got to another townland, his head would have been like bitten off by the Jersey Devil because that's how rumours start and that's how rumours grow. And rumours are very, it must have been really exciting at that time. You know, (laughs) while people probably were like really freaked out, it was also probably really exciting because nothing really happened. Yeah, well, that's how you get, like, that's how the rivalries between towns build up as well, isn't it, back in the day? Because people, it only take, there's only be a couple of people that would travel, like, three towns over. And then when they come back and report back, they could say whatever they wanted about that town. <laughs> you won't believe what they're saying about you. They're saying that you have never seen the Jersey Devil. They've seen him five times and everyone's like, well, fuck that. <laughs> I, th- I can, again, I can see value in this theory, but I'm not, I'm not with it. I just realised I had six theories, by the way. I just wrote down theory four twice. Theory five. There is, in fact, some sort of cryptid living in the Pine Barrens. Now, the Pine Barrens, I think geographically, is actually quite unusual. So the, the soil is really acidic. And but yet these vast pine forests have grown. So in itself, it's quite an unusual place. There's also a nuclear power plant nearby. You know, that means mutants. It does mean mutants, but I question whether that was around in 1909. Because <laughs> if it was, those people in New Jersey were under something. Very ahead of their time, mutants. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the one I'm, I'm with. I am fascinated by this story because I need it to be a cryptid. 
I need this to be some kind of cryptid thing. But I'm also mildly concerned that it is just Satan boffing about in the Pine Barrens. I don't, I really feel like when people say things like that where they're like, it's the devil himself, surely he has better things to be doing. That's just my argument. I mean, if I, I've seen the Lil Nas video. Okay. <laughs> I've seen the devil then. I was no. like, whoa. I've seen the devil because <laughs> that is the most important thing to him is showing himself to me of all people. <laughs> now, I've seen the Lil Nas video and I can tell you that he has, he definitely has more better things to be doing than bopping around the Pine Barrens. I just like that it's so demonic looking pagan lord demonic looking like it's got a goat's head it's got hooves it's got wings a forked tail it flies well like what kind of cryptid are we dealing with here it's almost like a fawn with wings right yeah because fawns are real they just got hunted into extinction right okay sure theory number six it's an owl that's it is that a genuine theory or is that one you just tagged in <laughs> Do you know what? I always add it's a thou- it's an owl as a theory because I think it's funny. But in this instance, I think some of it is genuine because I read a bazillion and one different real people encounters with the Jersey Devil. And a lot of them were like, I saw this really big winged creature at nighttime fly over my car. And I'm like, that's an owl. That's probably an owl or it's probably it's probably a bird, actually. Or ju- it's just something that is that just exists with wings. And it's freaked you out because it's nighttime and you probably haven't seen it up close. And I'm, it's an owl. So in this instance, maybe it's half owls is probably a better theory. Can owls slash trash cans? I'm personally not an owl, so I can't speak on behalf of the entirety of the owl population. I'm going to say, yeah, they probably could if they really put their mind to it. But they would have been che- like, I, this is not owls. This is never, it's never owls, all right? Owls is lazy. It's a lazy, lazy theory. So it's never owls, okay? It's not owls. I, we need to talk about Frank and Katie. Okay, well, Frank and Katie's stories. I chose both of those stories because I thought they were very similar and very interesting. And I like a theme through my stories. And also, like I said, a lot of the stories of sightings of the Jersey Devil were birds at night time but I will say look up any video evidence and photographic evidence of the Jersey Devil if you need a good laugh if you need something to lift your spirits because a lot of them are hilarious but the stories of screaming in the woods I thought were interesting so yeah this is what I like these two theories these two stories intrigued me because I'm I'm of the belief that the Jersey Devil is a real thing but what is it is the question. I feel like the goat's head and the forked tail might have been added to make it sound more like a devil back in the day Mm. because it's more of a real thing. But I do think there's something knocking about. You know what that screaming sounds like, don't you? Bigfoot. Sorry, the screaming sounds like Bigfoot. Bigfoot famously screaming. You've been watching too much Finding Bigfoot because how often do they respond? Do you know what it is? All these years, the people that have been hearing screaming in the woods are hearing those guys from Finding Bigfoot doing their Bigfoot calls in the wilderness and thinking it's something else. That's what they're hearing. This is an endless loop of people thinking they're hearing something when they're actually not. They're hearing the guys from Finding Bigfoot. Okay, so if it's not Bigfoot, that's fair. But there is something like it's really hard to just shred a trash can. Okay, fair. I will give you that one. That's a bit of a weird one. But there are lots of um, benefits that that bartender could get from having a a slash trash can. You know, it's big business, like big tourist industry having uh, the Jersey Devil in the Pine Barrens. And I'm not I'm not like judging them for that, because I think if you're going to make money, if you're going to have a tourist tourist industry in your town that doesn't hurt anybody and you want it to be encrypted, by all means, go for it. Like what's the bounty at the moment for Bigfoot? Like two million dollars or something? Yep. Have you found him yet? Because we could do with that $2 million. That $2 million is a shrewd business move by Oklahoma because I don't remember there being many Bigfoot sightings in Oklahoma. If it was Washington, I'd be like, okay, they must actually start to be taking it seriously. Like if it was Washington State, but I don't know about Oklahoma. But I just feel like these stories, you got the screaming and then the Katie story, you've got the grunting. And that made me think of that story in the cabin. Do you know the hunting cabin and that, oh, all those noises? Oh, yes. Oh, no, that was an awful story. Yes, I do know the one you're talking about. So maybe it's the same thing. Well, I don't know if it's the same thing, but I, do you know what? I would love for it to be real because I love a cryptid. I think they're my favorite stories to do because they're always so steeped in lore. And then there's always people who see it in the modern world. And you know what? If it's real, I will celebrate it. If it's real, I will have a drink and say, well done, Jersey Devil. You proved all the haters wrong. What if you're the person that sees it? Are you going to stop and have a drink with it? I'll have a drink and say, 
Well done, Jersey Devil. You've proved all the haters wrong. Not going to lie, I'm quite freaked out. Don't know if I can keep my drink down, but we'll give it a go. <laughs> if you enjoyed today's episode, you can find more about us on com. You can send in your own story to Podcast at gmail.com. You can support us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content. And on that note... We shall see you next week. Bye.